Good morning, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to this webinar on corporate PPAs, understanding and handling risks. My name is Bernice Lamblin, and I'm the Corporate Energy Series Director at Green Power Global. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to welcome so many listeners to this afternoon's webinar. We have received over 400 registrations, which is a great testament to the excellent speeches we have participating and the importance of the subject area. Please be aware that this session is being recorded and a link will be emailed to you shortly after the webinar is complete, so you will be able to listen again and share with your colleagues if you wish. So please be aware that this session is being recorded. <laughs> and so just to let you know a bit about Green Power Global, it was founded in 2003 to accelerate the fight against climate change through creating live events. So these are commercial events that focus on connecting senior level decision makers. Together, we accelerate projects, we spread best practice and deal with strategic decisions. Today's webinar takes place ahead of Corporate Energy Series Europe to be held at Hotel Intercontinental in Paris on the 21st and 22nd of May. So the event will gather corporates and industrials, renewable energy project developers, utilities, banks, law and advisory firms to discuss the challenges and opportunities of the sourcing and procuring of renewable electricity. So please do visit corporateenergyseries.eu.com for more information. Which brings me to today's webinar on corporate PPAs, understanding and handling risks. As it has been widely shared in recent news, corporate procurement of renewable energy has had a great year in 2018. With 13.4 gigawatts of clean energy contracts signed by 121 companies in 21 different countries last year. So corporate power purchase agreements, or PPAs, are an increasingly attractive option for large global corporations to ensure their operations are powered by renewables. But those 10 to 20 years contracts are also um, associated with important risks for businesses. So while the corporate PPA market is starting to develop in Europe, notably with the first contracts just signed in Poland, Spain, Germany, and the first ones to come in France this year, it is already more advanced in the USA. So innovative models such as the aggregation model, for example, have already started flourishing to help various types of organizations mitigate the risks associated with signing corporate PPAs related to price, volume, shape, etc. So over the next hour, we'll explore the following questions around corporate PPA risks. What types of risks are associated with signing corporate PPAs? What mitigation strategies can be applied to which situation? What are virtual PPAs and what are their advantages? What resources are available to corporates seeking advice on how to hand handle risks? I feel extremely privileged to welcome three excellent speakers this afternoon to address this topic. Firstly, we welcome James Lewis, Director International Clean Tech at Schneider Electric Energy and Sustainability Services. James has over 12 years of experience in sustainability with a background in sales, marketing, consulting and research. James Lewis leads Schneider Electric's work in markets outside of the US. He facilitates corporate PPAs in mature renewable energy markets such as India and Mexico, and also works with their clients to evaluate opportunities in emerging markets around the world. We are then joined by Mark Porter, who is Director at Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. Mark has been focusing on renewable energy from 2007 and has an extensive experience with onshore and solar PV projects. In the renewable energy sector, he has undertaken project finance, project and slash portfolio m and M&A, commercial consultancy, and detailed financial modeling for a very diverse range of clients, including public and private sector organizations. Mark has been working to support additional renewable energy procurement with non-utility buyers since March 2016. Finally, we are joined by Alexandre Sorco, business development at Uniper France. Alexandre Sorco is in charge of Renewable Direct Marketing and PPA at Uniper France since 2015. Alexandre first worked at the French Energy Regulatory Commission, or CRE, then at Auto Securities as a financial analyst for utilities. 
He joined Uniper France in 2011 as Power and Gas Key Account Manager for European industrial customers. Each of the speakers will take 5 to 10 minutes to present their views, following which we will take questions from our listeners. You can submit your questions via Twitter using hashtag CSEurope or using the question box on the GoToWebinar bar to the right of your screen. So please don't be shy, we'll try and get through as many relevant questions as possible in this hour time frame. And with that, I'll show now hand over to our first speaker, James Lewis. James, the floor is yours thanks, now. Thanks, Bernice, and thank you. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks also for having me to speak on this webinar. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Lewis from Schneider Electric. Um, just as a, an introduction, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Schneider Electric as a provider of electrical products, switch gear, building management systems, etc. Um, I actually work within the advisory part of the business, energy and sustainability services. Uh, Bernice, could you just flick to the next slide? I'm not sure if I have control. Um, so not to labor this point, but uh, a, a large global company based out of Paris, France. Um, and on the right hand side, as I say, I sit within the energy and sustainability services division. So we manage energy on behalf of many corporate clients. Um, and specific to this, we work as, you know, a significant amount of work in the renewable energy space, advising clients on renewables purchases, um, including PPAs. So we're very active in the PPA space. We've advised now uh, our Fortune 500, Global 500 clients on over five gigawatts of power purchase agreements, both direct and virtual. Um, and currently very active in Europe, which is obviously of interest to this audience with, uh, with the emergence of that market. Um, but as Berenice mentioned as well, would like to touch on the fact that there are opportunities around the world for PPAs. Mark's going to talk in depth about the virtual PPA, which is prevalent in the US, um, but also a lot of opportunity in the places like Mexico, historically in India, Australia, and emerging markets and the likes of South America. So an exciting time to be in the, uh, in the, in the market for renewables. And um, I would also add that we are, as Schneider Electric, a signatory to the RE100, so we have a 100% renewable energy target. So we're actually working internally to, to get uh, to achieve those goals and, and hopefully bring some of that insight um, to our clients as we're working with them. So if you can just flip to the next slide, Berenice. So just a very brief overview of what we're talking about here. Obviously, this is the power purchase agreement, which is a long-term contract, um, which includes uh, certificates, guarantees of origin in Europe and other uh, mechanisms around the world, which allow corporate organizations to make claims about renewable energy purchases. Um, the general idea of a corporate PPA is that the commitment from a company for the long term allows a developer of a project to go and seek finance, to build a constructor project, and therefore the commitment of the, uh, the corporate organization allows the project to get built. Uh, for those of you aware of the term, it's sort of the, the concept of additionality. They can take different forms. Uh, I think in Europe, it's been probably the, the prevalent model has been the direct or sleeve deal, which allow, which really delivers energy into a facility. Uh, whereas in the US, for example, the virtual or synthetic deal, which Mark will talk about more, is, uh, has been the prevalent and continues to be the prevalent model. Uh, but I think the key thing here is that uh, power purchase agreements, whereas a few years ago, Corporates were signing them, probably aware they weren't going to make much money, but certainly wanted to uh, engage in PPAs four or five years ago for the green credentials. Now it's really about economics as much as it is about environmental benefits um, because there's no input fuel cost to a corporate PPA through renewable energy, uh, we can often find deals below market price. And that's obviously opened up the market to many more companies beyond those that have uh, the strongest sustainability targets. Thanks, Bernice, if you can move on to the next slide. So just briefly wanted to talk about the models that we, uh, that we have in play, because the risks and the opportunities differ depending on the type of model. Um, in this example, we're, we're referring to the financial or virtual or even synthetic PPA, which I think is becoming more popular in Europe. Um, and as I said before, certainly very popular already in the US and, and Australia, for example. 
Um, briefly, this is a, a financial contract. It doesn't deliver energy. You don't see the delivered energy on your electricity bill. But the idea here is that the, the corporate buyer on the right-hand side signs an agreement uh, at a fixed price with a renewable energy project. Uh, that project sells its electricity into the grid and receives a price for that. And depending on the price, there is a financial settlement between the corporate buyer and the renewable energy project, which either makes money if it's in favor of the corporate buyer, or potentially loses money, where the corporate buyer has to uh, make the renewable energy developer whole. In every situation, the certificates, the guarantees of origin, or the LGCs, or the RECs in the US, flow to the corporate buyer to make environmental claims. And also, the utility contract that you already have for your electricity remains in place. This does not affect your physical supply of electricity into your factories or your facilities or your, or your offices. Um, some of the, the benefits, I guess, are that this is quite flexible. It allows aggregation of your load across multiple different facilities, even across countries or different states, um, and allows you know, to hit large targets. Uh, but it can be quite complex. So uh, particularly for European companies or international companies reporting uh, for accounting purposes under international reporting standards can introduce some complexities or probably will introduce some complexities, um, including the use of derivative accounting and other things. Um, so in terms of risks, I think one of the, the risks here is um, aligned to finance and accounting. How do you make sure your finance and accounting team are comfortable with this type of contract? And what strategies can you put in place to actually mitigate the impact of, uh, of such a contract? But as I say, uh, certainly a lot of, lot of benefits too. One of those, as I mentioned, is the ability to aggregate load across multiple different countries. So in Europe, you could use a virtual PPA from one country um, and utilize it for multiple other countries if you have facilities across more than, more than one uh, geography. The challenge there, and potentially the risk, uh, depends on, on how much you're looking at a power purchase agreement to create some, some hedge value. Um, you would really need to look at the correlation between your load in one country and where you might have a project in another to see if the hedge value of a PPA is important to you, uh, what is the level of that correlation, uh, and, and how much does it help or hinder your, your PPA. The other point of this, I think, is you know it's a double-edged sword. Um, the virtual PPA is relatively new for most companies, and so it can be a, a complex negotiation and quite a new concept to uh, to socialize internally. But at the same time, it's a, a, a discussion and a negotiation between two parties. So in that sense, it can be a little less complex uh, than a direct PPA, depending on, on how you go to market for a direct power purchase agreement. Bernice, if you could flick to the next slide, please. So the retail or direct or sleeved power purchase agreement is maybe a more familiar structure in Europe and generally within organizations. We find this is you know, at the early stages of our advisory process an easier concept to understand. Uh, the summary here is that you're still signing a deal with a renewable energy project. It's typically a long-term deal, and it will still allow a project to get built. It still enables that additionality but you're actually also including the electricity retail portion of a contract and having your energy sleeved through to your facility. So you'll actually see the delivered energy, in this case, on your utility bill. Um, that, again, has benefits. Um, it provides very good hedge value. It, it, it really provides you very clear cost savings. Uh, but it has some limitations and risks as well. Uh, typically, it's difficult to sleeve energy or deliver energy across borders. So you might be pretty restricted to operating within a certain country. So that might in turn uh, be a risk in terms of how you meet your environmental target. Um, and depending on the way that you go to market as well, it can be the case that you are looking to lock in not only the PPA, but also the retail contract element uh, for the long term. Again, you can mitigate this risk by maybe separating out the, uh, the processes, find the best PPA in the market first, and then find the best leaving partner. Uh, but that can be a risk as well. Locking into a long-term retail contract is a, is a risk that many of our clients aren't too keen to take. Thanks, Bernice. Uh, just quickly as well, I, I wanted to touch on the fact that you know, we talked to a lot of our uh, clients about 
the strength of deals, uh, but if you don't get a deal done in the first place, it's a, it's a moot point. So um, even before the power purchase agreement is in place, uh, one of the big risks here is not getting the right internal alignment and the right internal approval. We see that time and time again as the big barrier and the big risk to getting these deals done. So make sure you have internal alignment, particularly important if you're working across multiple geographies, uh, trying to do a deal, say, using your corporate head office to support a, a, a deal in Australia, for example, make sure you've got that internal alignment and also a champion at the right level because these deals typically will need to get board approval. Think also about the not just um, once the deal is done, but also what is the, the pre-construction risk? Um, how likely is the project to actually achieve financial close? And how many uh, conditions are placed on the contract, your PPA, um, that may prevent the deal actually eventuating and ultimately the project getting built? And also think about the construction risk. You know, once the project is in construction, um, what delay damages are in place, what are the chances that maybe the, the project is not built in the time scale that you're, you're thinking about. So again, that's something within the PPA contract to think carefully about uh, and protect yourself against as a buyer. Thanks, Bernice. And Mark's going to talk about you know, the, the PPA itself and some of the risks involved you know, as it's operating, but I think once the PPA has been signed, the project has been constructed, and it's delivering your guarantees of origin and your energy in whatever form that is under the financial or virtual model, um, it's an ongoing process. You know, these things go on for 10, 12, 15, maybe even 20 years. So put systems in place that allow you to monitor the performance of the project over time, um, even managing risks as simple as, as billing issues. Um, you know, there are genuine mistakes sometimes in, in billing uh, around PPAs through the settlement process, which you know, there might be errors. We've seen that before um, in, in certain PPAs. So ongoing tracking of the performance of the project, both for internal um, purposes and making sure that your accounting team are, are managing the power purchase agreement appropriately, but also simply to make sure you're not uh, missing out on revenue or, uh, or cost savings, uh, managing the, the the billing, auditing that, and so on on, a, on an ongoing basis is one of the things to think about as you're tracking the performance of your PPA. So with that, uh, conscious that very much taken up my time, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Mark and look forward to questions. Thank you very much, James. Uh, great presentation. And uh, we'll now go on to Mark's presentation. So I'll just unmute to you, Mark. Mark, I think you need to unmute yourself. Oh, I need to be unmute myself. Forgive me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Benny. Um, thank you, James, as well. And good, uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Um, James, that was a great talk. Thank you. And I think you know, one of the things that often is overlooked is the kind of is the post PPA uh, uh, period. Uh, it, it is a, it is a um, you know, the, the journey up until signing that PPA is often in many people's minds the, the thing, the moment. Um, but actually then realizing that, that managing that contract on, ongoing for the next for the remainder of the term is clearly where the rubber hits the road. So James, that's a really, really important point. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so yes, good day everyone. Thank you very much for having me on the webinar today. This is really, really exciting. Uh, my name is Mark Porter. I'm working with the Re newly formed Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. Um, I won't go into all the gory details of how we got where we are, but ultimately we are working across multiple sectors with multiple actors or all actors uh, trying to help accelerate this space um, and really help uh, buyers and sellers and, and intermediaries understand exactly uh, this market, how, where the barriers are and then how we can collectively overcome that. So I'm going to talk today a wee bit about uh, understanding some of the specific risks and I'm going to be, um, thank you Bernice, uh, talking specifically about the VPPA. Um, a lot of the experience that we have comes uh, directly out of the US, uh, despite my accent. Um, and so that's really where I think we can add a bit of value on, on today's web webinar. I think that... Uh, and I'm sorry, just to mention that a lot, of the, a lot of the material I'm drawing from is from a larger, about 80 page or so, kind of a guide to some of the VPPA risks that we've seen and, and how various different organizations are managing those. Um, just as a heads up, that's available on our website. So getting into the, into the nitty gritty, what are the risks involved in a VPPA? 
So I've written these across the top here, uh, really as an intent to, uh, as a bit of a leave behind for everyone who is listening and then listening again. Um, the risk there are there are a range of risks within these transactions, and I mean, let's let's you know let's also be be kind of upfront that the the companies that are doing these transactions, this is not what they do for a living. This is non-core, and so understanding a lot of these risks can often take quite a bit of work, in it, and they're quite alien. Uh, one of the things that we always, uh, always, always uh, are recommending whenever we are asked is that bringing on a consultant or an advisor to support you through the analysis of these risks is really, really important. The uh, uh, because the company, the, these projects are running for the long term, and and people really should have a very good idea of understanding exactly where the risks are. Uh, finding that out three years into a deal, I, I don't think is a great necessarily a great position to be in. I won't labor and read off the slide here, but Bernice, if we could move on to the next slide, what I did do was highlight where are some of the key risks in all of these. And so and this I'll spend a wee bit of time on. And so taking it from the from the top, if we're thinking about the source of the uncertainty, what's driving some of these risks and, and some of the, the, um, the, the variabilities that we might see through the operating period of the contract, we have on one side, we have the actual renewable energy generator itself, the project. And on the other side, we have the market and how that is going to move independent of our project. Flowing down, what are the specific uncertainties we have here? Well, if we take the renewable energy project or the generator on, on the left-hand kind of vague column there, we know that production volume is uncertain, assuming we're pulling this from a wind or a solar uh, facility. If we have a hydro or a biomass facility, I think that's, that's a much lower risk. We can control that much more. The production shape is uncertain, and I'll get into what shape exactly means uh, in a moment, um, but we don't know exactly when generation is going to come out. And again, I would say that's somewhat mitigated, or is relatively or can be mitigated through a hydro or a biomass facility. On the market side, we know that it's a market and prices go up and down based on uh, supply, demand, economics, and other factors. And so the prices will vary over time. And then clearly prices vary by geography. Again, really the same, same forces at work in different locales driving a different, uh, different pricing mix. And so those, the two sources and the four areas of uncertainty drive the five risks. And so what we're going to walk through now fairly, very briefly um, is kind of a, a look-see at each of those risks. Um, each slide we have coming up talks about, uh, talks about, thank you, Vanessa, talks about each of them in, in a relative amount of detail. I'll skim over it here because I'm actually keen to get into a QA. and a um, So we skipped operational risk, and that really was deliberate. That really is around how well is the project being maintained um, and the risk around that, which is fairly easily contractually uh, sorted, but it's something that, that, that one should not lose sight of. Um, volume risk is really what it suggests is around how much, what is the output going to be for this project over a given year? And from a buyer's perspective, comparing that to what is my renewable energy or my, my, my energy targets on a, on a carbon renewables or whatever the basis might be, and am I going to meet, those, meet that target from, get, get sufficient output from this project? And there are, there are a number of different ways of, of managing that, which you know, we can certainly go into later. But ultimately, as a buyer, your risk here is that whether you need to go out to the market and procure some unbundled recs to meet a shortfall, um, and or risk not fulfilling your sustainability commitments. You know, are what are the what are the price of those unbundled um, environmental attributes, be they uh, geos from Europe or recs from the US or um, elsewhere? Are they available? And really, how does that impact the strength of the claim that you are able to make? Bernice, next slide, if you could, please. Thank you. So on the shape risk side, this really is talking around the time of generation and the time of your consumption as a buyer, and how does that correlate with the power prices? So taking an extreme example, if we have a wind farm that only is producing at night for whatever reason, uh, the, renewable, the resource being strongest, we are consuming during the day, prices are low at night, we're paying a high price during the day, there is, a, there is a, a, an imbalance there with the, with the shape of generation and the time. And so that really is 
is kind of mitigatable through there are various products out there and again we can pick up more on those um, and then also analysis and good you know wind or real solar resource data can help you understand kind of what this risk might be what you might be exposed to during the during the um, uh, the contract thank you Bernice. we're getting really good at this um, so price risk really here this is all around the the, the volatility of a shifting shifting electricity prices in the wholesale market. Um, one of the phenomenons that we've seen in the US in certain regions is largely driven by the production tax credit, which um, unless anyone wants to, I won't go into in too great depth, that is effectively incenting generators to produce despite when prices go are negative and going down to a certain, you know, around 20 or so dollars per megawatt hour. And that's a, that's a relatively unique thing in the US. But if you if you imagine for, you know, for a second, you are controlling the, the grid or the independent system operator and you have too much capacity in a certain area, the approach is to use price signals to get, to get generators to turn off, to make it no longer economic for them to generate. And so prices go lower and lower and lower and lower. Generators don't generally want to turn off, want to switch off. Um, and so the prices are being moved lower and lower to incent that. The, in the US, given the given the, the, the market we have with the production tax credit, the the generators are still effectively earning earning a return for their investors, even if the prices are moving down to very low levels, which under a virtual power purchase agreement, we're thinking back to James' structure earlier, if you're a buyer in that instance, you are exp you can be exposed to that uh, price that pricing um, volatility. Again, there are we have seen during the due to the kind of the, emer the maturing or the gradual maturing of this market, there are contractual structures that can help uh, eliminate that exposure as a, a, to the buyer and place that back on the generator to put the onus on them, um, zero price floors, etc. And that really is, it's a relatively new contractual development that's, being, that's now being financed in, in many projects. And so we're seeing that the, the the behavior that was impacting some of the some of the earlier projects that are signed are not as heavily impacting the ones that are being signed now because of those mitigations that are being added in. And uh, basis risk. So basis risk is the one that always makes people's head hurt. Um, but fairly simply, there'll be a price that the buyer receives. For, for the production, um, the price that the, the the buyer pays for your own consumption, and basis risk, is, and then there will be a difference in those two prices. And if that were fixed, then you could price that into the into the contract. However, basis risk is all around the movement, the delta, the shit there, how how great the change in that in that in the change in the in the gap between the two over the life of the contract. That's really where basis risk comes the, on this side of this type of basis risk where it comes to um, comes to fruition um, and that's a very difficult risk to really price out um, from a mitigation perspective we are seeing products that are starting to come to market to try and address this although I would say they are new and you know people are still experimenting with them and you know and kind of help the help the development there to make it both easy for people to understand going back to James's point around internal buy-in if this is too complicated people won't get it and and other and there are also effective tools to manage this on the way through. Next slide. Okay, I think that's the end. So in which case, thank you very much. Um, hopefully that wasn't too too quick. Um, but I will hand back over to Bernice to move us forward and look forward to Q and A. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, so I'll now hand over to our last panelist, Alexandre Soroko from Uniper. So Alexandre. Um, I know you don't have a presentation slides, which is totally fine, and I'll leave you to um, talk a bit more about kind of the European uh, context and, and from your own experience. Hi, Bernie. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks also to Mark and, uh, and James for uh, for the previous explanation. Sorry for uh, for the fact that I have no slide, but uh, I stepped in uh, uh, on short notice uh, in this webinar, and I'm very happy to speak. Uh, to such a large audience, and um, perhaps uh, a first introduction to Uniper and to myself before uh, I go on the uh, 
uh, how we can understand and handling the risk in corporate TPA. Um, so Uniper is a utility, the vertical integrated utility based in Germany. We're active in France um, and we're active in France as an industrial supplier for power. Uh, we're also a major renewable energy purchaser in France within the new uh, support scheme, which is called uh, Feeding Premium, uh, which uh, most of you may know. May know. Um, and as such, we're experts in energy markets and also experts in structuring energy solutions for our clients uh, to bring them the best possible uh, power supply uh, corresponding to the needs. And of course, in a very quickly evolving environment in France today uh, and in the world, of course, uh, because there is, uh, as, as most of you know, a global movement toward green energy, and we try to uh, support our clients in this uh, in this evolution. Uh, and that's why we are also uh, now acting as a consultant uh, in structuring energy solutions, green energy solutions, and in particular, corporate PPAs on the French energy market. And um, many of many of you may know that uh, the French energy market uh, is not as developed as other. Uh, American or North European market as regards corporate PPA, as we are just uh, uh, starting to structure uh, this approach in France, and that's why uh, the upcoming conference in May uh, at the Hotel Intercontinental will be very interesting to see how corporate PPA uh, can be developed and adapted to the French uh, market, because of course there is also in French in France a huge uh, potential, but also in France some risk, as in every country, and perhaps. In, in, in some cases, some uh, risks which are specific to the to the French market. So our aim as, as a unicorn in France today is to bring renewable producers and consumers and industrial consumers together as both of them are our clients and, and we want to bring them uh, together. Um, so today it's about um, corporate PPA and how to handle risk um, related to corporate PPA. Uh, as uh, Merck and James on the line before, uh, there are many risks. So uh, I may come back to some of those risks and and, and then uh, try to 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 explain or or to 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 show how we can handle those uh, those risks. Uh, to be clear, um, what I'll be discussing today is uh, risk regarding physical or sleeve or direct corporate PPA, um, because as uh, as James said. Uh, in Europe and in particular in France, we are mainly discussing about direct corporate PPA for one reason, among other, is that what we are discussing is uh, corporate PPA between uh, between renewable assets based in France or located in France for French industrial customers. So we do not have cross-border issues so far, uh, uh, which are an argument in favor of uh, financial or virtual PPA. Of course, there are some discussion for corporate PPA with assets located outside of France, and then you have that uh, cross-border issue, among other. Um, but so I will focus on, on, on physical corporate PPA. Um, so first, as an introduction, corporate PPA, it's a lot about risk sharing, risk pricing, and who bears which risk over which maturity. Um, and this risk sharing and uh, uh, who bears the risk over which maturity um, is at the end, uh, um, uh, handled in the design of the corporate PK in the various clauses that uh, you may have, and who will uh, uh, say how those risks are covered and who covers those risks. And you also have to bear in mind that, uh, as it has been said, the corporate PK is a direct contract, a bilateral contract between an off-taker and between a producer. But in the loop, when you speak about um, direct corporate PK, there is also uh, 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 an important player, which is, um, let's, let's call it the sliver or um, the, the supplier of the top-up supply. So there is a third party which can, who can also bear some risk and price some risk over a given maturity. So this is also important when thinking about corporate PPA and when designing corporate PPA, because then you also have uh, the question about corporate PPA is one thing, and then in the corporate PPA or outside of the corporate PPA, you may also have a, something about the sleeving agreement, uh, which will also tackle and, and handle the risk. Um, so to go on the risk very, very briefly as time uh, goes by, um, there is what, what we can see in France at least, and what is uh, heavily discussed, of course, is on the one hand, the credit risk of the off-taker. Uh, of course, when you see all over, all over the world, um, many 
corporate PPAs are signed with off-takers for which the credit risk is assessed as quite low. In France, what we in France, what you can see is that the first movers are public or part public entities, for which of course the credit risk is also relatively low. But what comes next, and and the the, the bigger part, I hope, of the uh, corporate off takers in France, which might be interested in corporate PPA, are uh, off takers, for which the risk might be a bit higher than public or per public. Uh, entities, of course, most of them invest in grade, but still for who, for which a risk assessment uh, uh, will be needed, and this, of course, has an impact depending on the on the outcome of the risk assessment, on the design of the corporate PTA, and on the financing and on the securities which might, which might be put in place within the corporate PTA. Um, then the 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 certain risk, uh, to my view, is the one which is linked um, to what we can call the sieving or the one which is linked uh, in the back-to-back uh, -back of the top-up supply contract, so what, is, what we can also call the residual supply contract, and the corporate PPA, because the maturity of those both contracts is different. So the corporate PPA is signed for a long period, of a long maturity, let's say between 7 and 15 years, for example. The top-up supply contract, which is uh, the contract which allows uh, the supply of the residual consumption is generally signed for maximum three years. So you have to ensure when you design and when you negotiate a corporate PTA that the corporate PTA will allow a smooth contracting for the residual consumption. Uh, because if not, the off-taker, once he has signed a corporate PTA, may have some difficulties to find um, a, a supplier for the residual consumption. Um, so you have to keep that in mind uh, when negotiating a PPA, and you have to keep in mind, and I say that, of course, because uh, we're also a supplier in France, an established supplier, so we are the third uh, supplier in France. You have to keep in mind that when negotiating the corporate PPA, the risk for the off-taker, and at the end, the risk for the supplier of the top-up supply is not too big, because if not, the, the off-taker will have some difficulties to find uh, off-taker for a uh, supplier for the, for the residual consumption. This, of course, we, we, we discussed briefly before about marked market, and of course, in some cases, in a corporate PPA, there might be a marked to, uh, a marked to market risk, which is borne primarily, primarily by the off-taker of the residual consumption, but you may have a risk of a, of a marked market, and you have to handle that in order for the corporate PPA to be acceptable by the off-taker, but also to be bankable. Uh, so we may see that afterwards. Uh, another risk which is uh, quite important and which which pops up very quickly when discussing about uh, physical PPA is, of course, the, the, the risk um, of consolidation. So um, you do not have, or most of taker will not be willing to treat the corporate uh, PPA as, uh, as a lease. Uh, so you have to design the PPA quite carefully. So, of course, there's not something uh, quite new, but uh, you have to look after that in order for the corporate PPA not, um, not to fall under the IFRS uh, 16, uh, which would then lead and oblige the uh, off-taker to, to, to consolidate um, the corporate uh, PPA. And um, one, one other risk um, regards, of course, and this is something uh, which might be important in France, um, the, the risk linked to the design of cross-border PPAs. So as I said at the beginning, when you do uh, physical PPA, so what, what is uh, uh, taught mainly about in France, um, it's easy when you do that uh, in the same balancing zone, in the same uh, uh, market zone, but when you have to cross border and when you have uh, to supply the electricity via corporate PPA in another uh, pricing zone, so let's say for France in Spain or in Germany or wherever, then you also have to, to handle the price difference uh, between those two uh, uh, market zone. Um, and there that, that, that might be easy because to handle cross-border risk, so price difference and in particular spot prices differences between two market zones, so let's say France and Germany or France and Spain over the long term, so over uh, 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 7 to 15 years, is something which is not very easy and which might also make the corporate PTA um, more expensive. Uh, and I would end with the last risk and then uh, uh, show some ways to handle risk. 
um, is that when you do, and that's that's uh, uh, we have a lot of discussion right now in France about that, is that when you do a corporate PPA, that might be the basis and the precondition for getting uh, 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 financing arrangements with lenders and equity, but um, as it is quite new and as a corporate PPA in comparison to standard subsidized schemes or standard subsidized PPA which uh, we now have in France, you may have more risk and so uh, as you have more risk, the cost of the financing of the PPA may be higher and uh, then the LCOE of the corporate PPA might then also be higher. And what we have to avoid, of course, uh, in given uh, uh, geographies, where you mainly have very established subsidized PPA, is that when you switch to a merchant PPA, that the cost of the financing of the financing do not increase because if it increase, if it increases, then the um, LCOE also increases, um, and then um, um, the, the, those projects are less attractive for corporate off takers. Uh, so you also have to handle that, and that's a that's a big um, discussion uh, right now. Uh, so how how to handle uh, risk? Um, of course, first you have to um, identify all the all, all the possible risks which are linked to a corporate PPA. And here I'm speaking about first, of course, education. So uh, as you may know, um, we have to make for corporate off takers and for lenders and a financier the risk of a corporate PPA uh, are quite clear um, to identify those risks, but also to show the opportunities. So uh, at the end, the values that a PPA has for a, for a given company. And that's what we're trying to do quite a lot in France right now. So to say, these are the risks. We have in identified all of them. We can cover all of them value, uh, through various mechanisms. Uh, so that's, that's the first step. Um, then, of course, uh, how do you handle the credit risk I mentioned before? Uh, so there, when you have a subsidized scheme, that's quite easy because the off-taker is guaranteed by state, generally speaking. Uh, but when you have a corporate off-taker, then you have to do proper credit assessments and the various forms. Um, and that might not be always very uh, easy, of course, depending on the, uh, on the, on the off-taker. Uh, and this has, of course, then a consequence on the design of the corporate PPA, and that might have an influence on, for example, the security, uh, which when, which might be uh, requested for uh, um, the off-takers. Or even in some cases, uh, what I thought about is that um, when you do a standard project finance with non-risk course, then it might has a, it may have an impact on the way you will finance and whether it's still 100% non-risk course or whether it might be uh, slightly different. Um, then what we discuss also on what I mentioned before as a risk, are the risk linked to the sleeving uh, of the renewable volumes into the consumption, into the global consumption of the off-taker. Uh, and there, of course, you have to find the appropriate sleeving agreement in order to tackle what has been mentioned uh, before um, by Mark, which are the volume, shape, and price risk. And there you have to very carefully um, say who is responsible of what, uh, what, which risks are borne by the producer, which risks are borne by the off-taker. So let's say uh, because it's intermittent production, then of course the intermittency of the production, the risk linked to that is borne by the, uh, by the off-taker. But when you have for a reason or another, or another a, a, a long period uh, sh shutdown or stoppage of the production, then who is responsible for that and who is responsible for bearing the cost of the mark to market borne by the supplier of the residual consumption, which might be also uh, borne by the off-takers. Is it to be borne by um, the producer or not? Can you ensure that risk? Um, so that's uh, that's something very important. So you have to find the, 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 the appropriate living agreement in order to tackle uh, those risks. Uh, which leads me to say that in, in, a, in a general manner, and you have to find the right balance in the corporate PPA between bankability for uh, the lenders, so for the uh, the producer, but behind him for, for for the for the for the lenders and for the equity, um, and also uh, uh, acceptability by by the offtaker. Um, so, and we I also mentioned, and I will finish with that, um, the the financial risk for uh, for lenders. So there it goes beyond. Corporate PPA itself, of course, because it's not part of the arrangements 
itself of the cooperative and of the bilateral agreement between off takers and um, and producer but uh, there is uh, uh, probably new structuration for financing to find and this also concerns uh, security you may bring um, for financing corporate PPA. Uh, so that's uh, that's it for my part. Thanks for for your attention. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Alexandre, for for this uh, for this great uh, presentation, if I may say. And uh, so we're not going to go on, now going to go on to Q and A. So we'll take fifteen minutes. We started a tiny bit late, so um, we will. Uh, will take 15 minutes um, and don't worry everyone so in case we don't have enough time to answer the questions all the questions will be uh, publishing uh, some written answers after the webinar uh, for the questions we won't have time to cover today so in in terms of the questions we have some very interesting questions and i think the first ones would be and um, maybe a bit more for mark and james so in terms of the different markets so we have a question, and I think those questions kind of go together um, about, you know, what are your thoughts on the Southeast Asia uh, market for for PPAs, corporate PPAs, um, in terms of, you know, there's quite a lot of market in uncertainty. So what are your thoughts in terms of what can happen and the potential for corporate PPAs there? And then there's another question, which is similar. Um, and I will I will mention that at the same time before you start answering. Um, what are the perspectives for PPAs in economies um, of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where traditional energy supplies are, um, are kind of still relatively cheap? Um, so what what can be done there? So we have Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe. Um, James, Mike, uh, maybe James, do you want to start with with that? Sure. Yeah, yeah, I can have a go at that. It's a big, it's a big question, obviously. Um, <laughs> I would say, firstly, that um, you know there are lots of markets that are maybe more mature than Southeast Asia and Central Asia. So uh, there'll be some companies out there, maybe the leaders. Uh, you think about some of the big tech companies that have already tackled the more mature markets. You know, they've looked at the U.S., they're looking at Europe, they've maybe done something in Australia, um, and so now we're turning their sights to. Southeast Asia. I would say that for those companies that are not in that position, there are, I would suggest, you know, getting your feet wet or, or testing your your company's appetite, certainly um, go for the US or go for uh, Spain or Australia or somewhere that's more mature first. But to the question itself, um, Southeast Asia, we have some, seen some activity in Singapore. Um, there have been some, some uh, relatively, well, a couple of sort of medium-sized corporate PPAs. Singapore has some challenges around the amount of land it has and the amount of renewables it can actually fit onto the uh, onto the topography. Um, but there have been some activities there. Beyond that, not much. A little bit of activity in Taiwan. Um, and I know there's uh, movement in Vietnam towards um, looking at corporate PPAs, although the bankability of projects in Vietnam, I think, is proving a, it will prove a bit of a problem. And beyond that, we haven't seen much outside of sort of putting on-site solar on the roof through a PPA from an off-site perspective because of the nature of most markets in Southeast Asia. Um, they're quite monopolized. They're quite regulated. It's very difficult to get deals done. Um, so the, I guess the quick summary would be uh, focus maybe first on those more mature markets where there's a lot of case studies and precedent. Definitely keep an eye on Southeast Asia. Um, but in terms of the markets where deals have been done, it's really Singapore and Taiwan, I would say. And um, you know, we're definitely looking at those markets but don't see huge opportunity right now. Um, Central Asia, probably a similar story, really haven't seen much opportunity there. Um, the nature, I mean, there's a whole host of things we could talk about in the, to this question, but um, you know, not only do you want to look at um, all the risks that Alexandra and Mark um, uh, talked about, but just market risk, you know, what, what are the regulations, what are the policies, what's the government situation? Uh, there's a whole host of things maybe in Central Asia that you'd want to look at. So uh, again, without Going into more detail, I think the summary would be limited opportunity in Central Asia right now. Um, as with most emerging markets, uh, there might be some on-site solutions you could look at. Uh, on-site solar, for example, as a, you know, to take make a small dent in your emissions. Um, but beyond that, yeah, certainly we're seeing much more activity you know, in terms of emerging markets. I think South America is maybe somewhere to look, um, perhaps, you know, perhaps before Southeast Asia and Central Asia.
Yeah, no, thanks, James. Uh, this is Mark here. So I, I, I fully agree with what James has said. And I just actually just want to echo the point around, you know, if, if you're a relatively new buyer into this space, that that working in a more mature market, certainly if you're first, maybe even second deal uh, transaction, is, is actually really, really advisable. You know, just stepping back and thinking about it, you you are creating a, a whole series of internal processes and approval chains and everyone and monitoring from reporting trains and everything else um, that so why why be creating that whilst you're also trying to create the market that sounds like a, like a you, you've got two challenges there rather than one and both of them on their own are fairly significant and so to James's point working in a, in a, in a more mature market first so that you are you are working on your internal processes and once that's down pat and you understand where what the what your company really thinks and feels about these transactions will make you much better equipped to look at less mature markets. Um, I, I totally agree with, with James' assessment across uh, Central and Southeast Asia. You know, really to me in summary I would I would echo it and say the the approach right now is working much more with regulators to to help evolve those marketplaces because there is not an open market for transactions that you could walk up and do one tomorrow. Pause that. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you very much, both. Um, there's there are some a bit more technical questions coming up as well. So and and I really want to 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 ask them as well. So this one is about price. So um, someone is asking uh, if you have any advice on how to evaluate the right price for a PPA based on a local generation profile. Does anyone have to, has anything to, to answer to this? I can have a go. I, I'm not sure I understand the question, Bernice, but um, I mean, in terms of when we're looking at um, the the cost effectiveness of the PPA or otherwise, we're, we're certainly looking at historical prices over you know, a number of years and then also using either our own, a Schneider Electric, or third, and actually not all, and third party forward price curves to look at various different scenarios moving forward. You know, we, we'll take a look at what is a, um, you know, a very bearish forecast for that particular market. Um, uh, versus what's a, a quite bullish forecast. And really the decision is not whether that forecast is going to be correct or not. We all know it's going to be incorrect. Um, but what are the relative risks, what are the relative views of that corporate um, as to the accuracy of that, for, that forward price curve? And then is it a risk worth taking? Is it a deal that we think the risk is manageable and, and we can move forward? Um, more locally, I guess more specifically, we want to be looking very closely at the, the actual asset. Um, you know, what is the anticipated production of that asset? Um, and so we'll, we'll run a bunch of analyses around each, each project, and not each project, but each specific bid from each project, because a project can provide various different structures and, and pricing and, and risk mitigation options. So um, that's about looking at the project, you know, at a, at a very specific level, um, looking at its production profiles over a, over a standard year and making a call again as to the accuracy or otherwise of that. Um, yeah, that's probably a quick summary. Thank you very much. Anything to add, Alexander or Mark? Or shall we go on to the next question? Well, all fine for me. Thank you, Bernice. <laughs> and there is another question. On um, DC virtual PPAs entering into financial derivative markets sometime in the future, in the near future. You give us all the tough ones, Bernice, that's really good. <laughs> um, do we see VPPAs entering into a financial derivative market? So if I'm understanding the question correctly, and I might be able to get this wrong, I'm, I'm guessing that the question relates to whether these contracts will be tradable in the secondary market. James, Alexander, let me know if you have a, a different understanding of this question. Um, no, and if if that's if that is the question, then I would my my hunch would be probably not that soon. I just don't think the volumes are high enough and the contracts are consistent enough that you would you would you know it's not like using an ISDA or something else as a standard form contract. These contracts are relatively 
you know, bilaterally, bilaterally negotiated. And so I think it would be very hard to price that sort of that sort of an instrument onto the markets to be tr to be freely traded. Uh, yeah, it's, it's how I would respond. Assuming I'm getting the question right, which is a yeah. So the person has said that that is the question you understood okay. the question right. So. Cool. And then, yeah, so 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 my my original answer, I think I think still sounds. I just don't think there's enough homogeneity between the different contracts, and the volume is too low. Where in the in the near term, that that um. Uh, that I think it would be, they would be having them like tradable instruments on a marketplace, like you would have a, a foreign exchange contract or something else. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I think I'd think each one was too unique. Too unique. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, Mark. Um, at, a, at a general level, I think, as you say, is a, gen a generic product um, probably the case. I think there are some, certainly in the US, some movement to where um, some uh, banks and others are, are looking to secure PPAs and, and provide some um, some other products off the back of that. So I think on a maybe slightly more unique basis, a certain companies are looking to do that. But yeah, as a entering into the markets as a um, tradable instrument, I guess I, I sort of agree with Mark at this stage. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And um, there is another quite technical question, I think. Um, that seems interesting. So. Um, it's quite a long question. Considering the volume and shape risks uh, for a renewable energy generator, is the PPA limited by the minimum base load consumption of the corporate energy buyer when it's not coupled with energy storage? And if, if Bernice is having trouble getting back on okay. the line, then I took the question to be something around, given that we have volume and shape risk coming out of the back of a project, are PPAs limited by the by a kind of a minimum amount? So, are we likely to uh, it, uh, are we likely to, to to the production and shape risk is likely to be so far off from the the company's consumption as to be you know yeah to, to basically make the make the contract not worth doing? I think that was what I was taking from what I caught. Um, you know, and if, and if if that's if that's the case, if there is a huge delta between how much the product is producing and how much the company needs, so either they're inadvertently the product is producing, you know, two hundred percent of the forecast output, and which is massively in excess of the of the company's required, you know, re, re, you know required um, uh, environmental attributes to to retire and to meet their targets. I mean the 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 logical and and James Alexander jump in when you when you want the logical action in my mind would be to liquidate those those environmental attributes on the market or hold them over to future years um, when either growth of the company catches up or when targets increase or when there's a there's a low year so you've banked them and I I believe and I'm this is outside of my area of expertise but I believe that there is a whole there is a period of time by which you can hold an attribute from one year and retire it in a subsequent year. I don't think it's very many years, and I'm sure people on the phone know better than I do. But um, you know, bank those bank those environmental attributes for future use. If it's the other way, and and our, our project has has massively underproduced compared to what we need for our for our, um, our uh, to meet our targets, then you know I think there's a depending on what language you have in the contract around the around the developer needing to make the company whole to a certain amount, although there could be derivative accounting tri triggers if that, that clause is not worded very carefully. Um, it would be a case on, on the company to go out to the market and procure uh, unbundled environmental attributes to be able to meet their, meet, meet their, meet their goals, meet their targets. Um, and there'd be a cost to that. But also bearing in mind, the company hasn't paid the first time under, under, the, under the PPA or BPPA. Um, and so they're having to go to market. But there is a risk that, of course, market prices might be fluctuating if, say, it's a bad wind year or something and everybody else is in the market buying at the same time. And I'm going to pause there because I might be going yeah, down I might. the wrong path. Martin, thanks, Martin. And I just add to that as well, the virtual model, um, then there really isn't there is an opportunity, and some companies have done this, to actually deliberately over-purchase, uh, you know, to oversize your contract depending uh, compared to what you're producing. It's not certainly not appropriate for everybody, but if, if the overall arching driver is to access the guarantees of origin or the RECs, then there's no limit to the size of the 
the contract in theory that you can sign because it's just a financial contract. You're not, you know, under the virtual model, um, not looking for delivered energy. So I'll just maybe add that as a uh, another caveat. Yeah, really good point. Thanks, thanks, James. <laughs> Uh, but I, I would also add because um, if I correct so the question is on the relationship between the uh, amount of consumption and the amount of production and the relationship between the the shape of the curve of the producer and the shape of the consumption curve of the taker. Technically, uh, that's not an issue because be it in a virtual PP or in a physical PP, even if the production exceeds the consumption. Uh, you can always sell onto the market um, the uh, the electrical output in excess. Uh, you can also sell on the market the the environmental attributes. So that technically there is no barrier. Um, for example, to sign a corporate PPA with a producer which produces much more than the off taker consumes, uh, and then that's I guess a, a question of uh, opportunity or what you want to do with the with the corporate PPA. But technically, I do not see any problems to uh, different volumes and different shape for um, production and consumption. Uh, indeed, thank you okay. everyone for all of your time. James and, and Alexandra, it was a pleasure. Thanks to you. Yeah, likewise, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining. <laughs>